love is when I was looking at it, in what category would polytopes fall under it? Because I know uh, in what is the that's, that's exactly what the question is. Yeah. So there's no category of polytopes yet. Right. And the goal is to build it, and that's what this harm polytope business is about. Yeah, because it, it works really nicely like in vector spaces. You have that category with mm -hmm. the linear transformations, and you would think that that would be sort of mm -hmm. the analogy for, uh, for polytopes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's basically that's basically the idea, but it's it's kind of it's kind of open. Really? Yeah. That's why it's that's why it's an exciting project. Yeah, no, it's really cool. It's really interesting. Okay, so I was telling you about the Mobius inversion formula. So that says that if we have a pose at p, and if you have two functions from the pose set to some abelian group, which shows the integers, but it doesn't really matter, then if you have that g of x is equal to the sum for y bigger than or equal to x of f of y for all x, then you're going to have that f of x is the sum over y bigger than or equal to x of mu of x, y, g of y, for all x. So that was the Mobius inversion formula. Um, I don't know. Does anybody notice anything different about this? It's something very small. So, la so last time, I had y less than or equal to x. But as Dilo's pointing out, here I have y bigger than or equal to x. Um, and it just turns out that, that both versions of the Mobius inversion formula work out. So... Last time I proved the other one. <clears throat> and this is how I stated it last time. But uh, it turns out that, it, that exactly the same statement is true if instead of adding over y less than x, you add over y bigger than x. Okay. And if you think about it, actually, that, that makes sense because of what we said last time that uh, initially we defined the Mobius function to be computed from the bottom up. But then we proved that if you, that if you were to compute it in the with the same rule but from the top down, you're going to get the same Mobius function. Okay? And so that's precisely the, the same thing as, as reversing the order in the post. So, so that's why the, the, this other Mobius inversion formula holds. So last time we, we used this formula. Well, then maybe, maybe I should just remind you that uh, this two-variable Mobius function of the POSIT, one way of defining it is by saying, just forget about all the elements that are not less than or equal to x, sorry, that are not greater than or equal to x, and, and keep only the elements in the posit greater than or equal to x. And that's a sub posit. And in that sub posit, compute the Mobius number of y. Okay. Okay. So As I admitted when I, when I proved this theorem, when you first see this, you have no idea what this is about, what it's good for, etc. And uh, what I wanted to convince you starting this time, and I'm going to continue starting last time, and I'm going to continue today, is that this is a really beautiful formula that, that uh, has a lot of very nice applications. And uh, the point is that we can use, you can, we can apply it for any POSET, and we know lots of POSETs, and... Uh, for almost all the nice poses that, we, that we've seen, we're going to get very nice results. 
So last time, <coughs> we did it for the poset of divisors of n. And we got a formula for what's called Euler's. Sometimes they call this the totient function. And I've never seen that word except when it refers to this function. Phi of n, number of integers between 1 and n, relatively prime. And, uh, and the way that we did this was that, that we, we showed that, the, that mu of x, y is nice, equals something nice. And I said, I said what it is last time. It's, it's 0, 1, on my, or minus 1, according to some, some simple rule. And by having a nice formula for the Mobius function, we got a nice formula for for Euler's function, okay? And what I wanted to do today was basically do a couple more examples of uh, the Mobius inversion formula so that you can see the power, the power of it, okay? Um, so, So I, wa I wanted to do two examples. Maybe I'm going to let you guys choose democratically which one you want to see first. <laughs> I mean, wh what other nice posters do you know? The Boolean lattice. Okay, that's maybe the nicest poster that we know. And so that's one example that I want to do. What other nice posters do you know that we've seen in this class? The, the poset of uh, the intersection poset of a hyperplane arrangement. And we're definitely going to get to that one since we're talking about hyperplane arrangements. That's going to be the last example that I do. And there's another poset that we've seen that's very nice, which is the, the face poset of a polytope. So, what do you prefer? Polytopes or Boolean lattices? We're going to do both. What do you prefer first? Polytopes? Okay. <laughs> Do you say it because you, you don't like the Boolean letters? Or? Okay. You love polytopes. <laughs> okay. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm putting words in your mouth, but <laughs> uh, P equals uh, face poset of a polytope. Let's call the polytope Q. Okay? So we we want to we want to use the Mobius inversion formula, but often to be able to use it, you want to know that you have a nice Mobius function. Okay. Now, do you remember the Mobius function for this for this posit? So we we discussed what the, what this Mobius function was. We, uh, and we said that it's, that it's always 1 and minus 1, 1 and minus 1, 1 and minus 1. And, uh, and we said that this was a consequence of, of Euler's formula for the alternating sum f0 minus f1 plus f2 minus f3. In a polytope, that's, that's 0. Okay. So, okay, so let me, let me, let me say that. So if, if we have here the, the face posit, so maybe here is q. The, the top element is the whole polytope. The lowest element is the empty face. And then we have all the faces in between. And, uh, and we saw, when we talked about this, that uh, the Mobius numbers were very simple. It's one here. Then in the next, in the next level, they're minus ones. In the next level, they're ones, minus ones, and so on. So here, minus one. Here one, here minus one, here one, and so on. Okay, that's what that's what this Mobius function looks like. But that's only the that's only the the one the one variable Mobius function, and we need the two variable Mobius function. Right? So 
So this is mu sub q of, of uh, here, remember, the, the elements of this poset are faces of the, of the polytope, so let's, let's call it f. Okay? f is uh, uh, one of the elements of this poset. So now we're doing something a little bit different. Because now we need to be able to compute the Mobius number between f and g. We need to know what that is for f less than g. Okay, so this is mu sub q of f comma g. That's what I would like to compute. By the way, let me let me say this a little bit more explicitly. Uh, the Mobius number is just minus one to the dimension, right? The dimension zero things are one, the dimension one things are minus one, and so on. Okay. Okay, now how do we compute this? Well, we basically do what, what, uh, what, I, what I said over there. We're going to look at the poset of things greater than or equal to f. It looks like this. I have a, a little notational mistake here. Because the, the subcript is, is the name of the poset, right? And here also is the name of the poset. OK. So then I look in, in the poset at the things that are bigger than or equal to f. So that's this interval right here. OK. It's this thing here. And I find the Mobius number of g in that poset. OK? Now, I don't know if you guys remember this. What, what do you remember about intervals in a, in a phase poset of a polytope? What's that? It's a polytope. So, so we, we discussed this, that if you look at any interval in the, in the uh, poset of phases of a polytope, we get the phase poset of a smaller polytope, which we called Q mod F. Okay, so this is the same thing. This thing is the phase poset of the polytope that we called Q mod F. So it's called the the phase figure. And so that means that we are actually just computing a Mobius number inside a phase poset, and so that's just minus one to the dimension, right? So minus one to the dimension of g, but, but g considered inside, inside here, right? So, so here, we don't consider the full dimension of g. We consider the dimension of g minus the dimension of f. So minus 1 to the dimension of g minus the dimension of f. Okay. And so, again, let me reiterate that if you have a nice formula for the Mobius function, then that's potential for nice consequences. Okay. So now we're going we're gonna to count something. Um, just like here we were counting integers, here we would like to count something involving polytopes. And we have counted several things involving polytopes, but they kind of fall into two categories. We have counted things related to faces, or we have counted things related to uh, lattice points. And uh, it turns out that this works out very beautifully in terms of lattice points, okay? Because let's say that you have some face of P, of, of uh, Q, sorry, my polytope is called Q. Okay. So imagine you have some polytope here, maybe it's three dimensional, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Okay. And we have some face F. Okay. So now let's, let's, let's look at the Erhard polynomial of f. Okay? So that's 
L sub f of some variable that we're going to call t. <coughs> okay. Now, I want to I want to express express it as some kind of summation of uh, over other elements of the poset. Okay. And one thing that I can do is that I can look at the lattice points in this phase and classify them as the ones that are interior to the face, the ones that are interior to the edge, the ones that are interior to the edge, the ones that are interior to the point, and so on. So in other words, what I'm saying is I'm taking my face F and I'm splitting it up into open things, where this is the interior of F, and then here I have the, the four edges, and, and here I have the four vertices. And I can say that, we will just fill this in so that you can see it. So then I'm saying that if you want to count lattice points in the face, you can just count the lattice points in each one of these pieces. Okay? But now, if you notice, each one of these things, these are precisely the faces of F, right? So they're the things that are below F in the poset. So what I'm saying here is that this is the summation over things less than or equal to f in the poset of now what I do is that for example if here I have g if, if g is this edge then I compute things in the relative interior of g so I can express my, my error polynomial as the sum of the interior are polynomials of all the faces. Okay. Does that make sense? Actually, we, we, we did it already. We, we've done this before. Um, and what I want to point out is that this is exactly the kind of thing that this is asking for you to do Mobius inversion. You have two functions. So one function is the error polynomial, and the other one is the interior error polynomial. And they're related exactly by, by that relation. Okay. And that means that you can go ahead and apply the Mobius inversion and obtain a formula for this one in terms of this one. So what are you going to get? You're going to get this, the, sa the same kind of thing, except you just have to put the Mobius function in here. Okay. Um, now it looks like we have, we have two versions of, of Mobius inversion, and here I'm doing it with less than or equal. And so here, g is less than or equal to f, so I need to put the Mobius function of g comma f, where g is, is smaller than f. Right? And so then I, what I get is the summation of g less than or equal to f of minus 1 to the dimension of g minus the dimension of f times l g of t. Okay? Or if I multiply both sides by minus 1 to the dimension of f, then I'm going to get rid of this thing, and I get minus 1 to the dimension of f times this. Okay? But I hope you recognize this. This is, this is exactly uh, the kind of thing that Erhard reciprocity deals with. And this is exactly the Erhard polynomial of f evaluated at minus t. Okay. And so what, what we get here is, is a, a nice relation between the Erhard polynomials of, of f and all the faces below it. Okay. And so, so this should show you that, that Erhard theory uh, very, very naturally goes together with Mobius inversion. Okay. Actually, one of the proofs of Erhard reciprocity goes through Mobius inversion. And you'll find that if you, if you end up going deep, more deeply into Erhard polynomials and counting lattice points, then you're going to be finding the Mobius inversion formula all the time. In, in, and this is the kind of way in which it appears. 
with, with this key idea. This is, this is the, the key idea. Okay. So that's, so that's more or less how, how things work out for the face pulse set of a polytope. From here to here? Yeah. Why did you change the relative interior on the polytope? You went, you went to the whole polytope on, on the aircraft polynomial sheet. Uh huh. And just the interior of that. So maybe what I, should, what I should do to make this a little bit more transparent is to tell you that I'm saying that let me make this func this look like like my Mobius inversion, okay? So I'm saying that the left-hand side g of f is L sub f of t. And the right-hand side f of g is L sub the interior of t, okay? So the two functions that I'm considering are the function that sends a phase to its Erhard polynomial and the function that sends a phase to its interior Erhard polynomial, okay? And then you see that in the second step of Mobius inversion, I have to reverse the roles of f and g. So that's why all of a sudden f appears on the left-hand side and g appears on the right-hand side. Okay? So that's why. And you bring up a point that I hadn't realized, which is that actually here I'm giving you an example where my, my map is not to z, but to a polynomial ring. So here f and g are mapping from the poset to uh, polynomials in one variable. But like I said, this, this goes through for any abelian group, so, that, so that's fine. Okay? So that's, that's how this story goes. Very good point. I should have I should have also said um, I mean this is, this is true whether whether it's rational or not. We're just counting points and then and then th this this identity is true. And uh, Mobius inversion doesn't care if the if the polytope is rational or not. It, it exists, but it's not a polynomial, right? So, by so maybe instead, if instead of polynomial, I say function, then I don't even need this this to be a rational uh, a rational polytope. This is true. This is true, and and the thing that's not true is their hard reciprocity. Exactly. So so I should say that this is true. If P is rational. And if it's rational, then actually this is a quasi polynomial, which means that actually this is not this is not the ring of polynomials but but the ring but the ring of quasi polynomials. So let me check, fix that too. Sometimes you have to tweak these things according to what what exactly you need. And I actually don't have a good not a good name for this, so quasi polynomials. in T. Okay. If if it's rational. If it's not rational, then it's just functions. I don't know. Okay. Okay, so that's that's how this pans out for the face pose of a polytope. Now let's go to the let's go to the Boolean uh, pose set. So subsets of 1 up to n. Okay? Now again, if we want to use Mobius inversion, then it would be very nice if we had a nice formula for the Mobius function. And so let's let's try to make the same analysis here. Here we have the empty set. Here we have the whole set, the numbers from 1 up to n. 
And uh, this Mobius function you do remember, right? So this is, this is uh, it looks just like that. 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. So the Mobius function of evaluated in a set S is just minus 1 to the number of elements of S. Okay. So just like over here, it goes 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, 1, like that. But again, what we want is a, something a little bit stronger. We want to compute the Mobius number between any two sets, which maybe I will call, let me see what I call them in my notes to be consistent. Actually, come to think of it, this is not in the notes. I just, I just decided right before class that, that this is a very important example that I should show you. So unfortunately, it's not in the notes, but hopefully I can get it right and get it nice and clear. So we want to compute the Mobius function of S and T. And so we, we do the same thing, where we can just look at the subposed set of things that are greater than or equal to S. Okay. Now, what, what is What is this poset right here? The, the sets that contain S. So that means you contain S, and then from then on, you can decide whether or not you contain the other elements. Okay? So this is the poset of subsets of the complement of S. You have to contain S, and the other elements you may or may not contain. So this right here is the Boolean poset of the set minus s. Okay, it's just it's it's a boolean poset. And so what we get is the Mobius function inside that boolean poset of t but now but now it's t minus s because if if we look at it in this way then T already contains some of the, all the elements of S, and we're just looking at what other ones it does or doesn't contain. So, so we get this. In other words, we just get minus 1 to the number of elements of T minus number of elements of S. Okay. And so again, a, a beautiful formula. Very simple. For the Boolean poset. Okay. And now, given that I have such a nice formula, I would like to go ahead and uh, and use Mobius inversion. So, so here's the way that I want to think about this. And, uh, and this is something that I, I think you are familiar with in, in, in some sense or other. Um, what I'm going to show you is that in this case, Mobius inversion formula is exactly the same thing as the inclusion-exclusion formula. And I don't know if are you guys familiar with the inclusion exclusion formula? Maybe vaguely familiar, maybe you've seen it. So I, I want to remind you what it says. Um, and actually, it, there's a very easy way to say it, which is that it's like, those, it's like those puzzles where they tell you, okay, you know, you have a class. You have a classroom of kids, and then they tell you that maybe 20 of them like soccer, and 10 like volleyball, and 15 like basketball. So then you say, okay, soccer, volleyball, basketball, and then you know that there's 20 that like soccer, what did I say, 10 that like volleyball, and 15 that like basketball, maybe. Uh, and then they might, they might tell you, for example, that 
there are, I don't know, I'm making this up on the spot as you can see, but uh, um, let's say that there are five that like soccer and volleyball. So soccer and volleyball, there's five of them. And maybe ba basketball and volleyball, there's six of them. And then basketball and soccer, there are, I don't know, three of them. And then maybe there are there's one person that likes basketball, soccer ball, so basketball, soccer, and volleyball. Okay, and then they could ask you uh, all kinds of things. I don't know. They could ask you, for example, how many people uh, like soccer but nothing else. So a number of people. like soccer, don't like volleyball, and don't like basketball. This should sound like a GRE question to you. I'm sure, I'm sure you've had to do this in, in the, the GRE. OK. So what does this have to do with anything? Um, <clears throat> I, want to, I want to show you that, that this kind of problem is exactly what Mobius inversion is about which might be a little bit hard to tell right now. What we're going to do is we're going to think that 1, 2, up to n are properties that elements. So let's say that you have a, a set E of elements. Some set E, and maybe these are people. And you have some properties that elements of E can have or maybe don't have. Okay. So each element of for each element of E and every property, either they have it or they don't have it. Okay. So I'm thinking that here these are like sports. Okay. Then I'm going to define two functions. So uh, F, so let's say that S is a subset of the properties. Okay? And I'm going to say F of S is the number of people satisfying number of objects satisfying property S. So that, those are the numbers that I'm giving you there. Um, so maybe I should also tell you that the total number of students here is 40. I don't know. Does that make sense? Maybe. 40 total. Number of objects, objects that satisfy property S, I call that F of S. And G of S, I'm going to call the number of objects satisfying the properties. So here, the properties in S. And here, these are the ones that satisfy the properties in S and no others. OK? So these satisfy at least the properties in S. These satisfy exactly the properties in S. So then what can I say? The one satisfying the, at least the properties in S, well, you just have to sum over the supersets of S so, and G of T. So the ones having at least the properties in S, basically they have exactly the properties in T for some T bigger than S. Okay. And so this is begging for us to do Mobius inversion. Mobius inversion says that G of S is the sum over the supersets of S of F of T, where now we have to put the Mobius function here. And the Mobius function is that minus 1 to the T minus S. Okay. So number of elements in T 
minus the number of elements in S. Okay. So, for example, actually, it's really unfortunate that I <laughs> that I chose soccer and I called it S, and that's also what I what I did here. So let's change soccer to I don't know. Are there any other sports in the world? What's that? I'm just going to football, but like like this with a U. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what are, what are we trying to compute here? The number of people who like football, don't like volleyball, and don't like basketball. That's exactly g of f. Right? So in example, we're looking for g of f. Okay? And so then what we have to do is add up over all the supersets something like this. So f of f and then minus f of fb minus f of fb. Okay, so I add one sport and I have to change the sign. Or I add both sports but then I have to change the sign again and I get a plus. Okay. And, you're, and you realize that here I'm being very lazy and here this should really be the set football comma volleyball but Um, but then what is it? So f of f, well, those are the numbers that I gave you. There's 20 people who like football. Then football and basketball, there's three people. Football and volleyball, there's six people. And football, basketball, and volleyball, one person. And so the answer is exactly 12. <coughs> now, you'll notice that you, I mean, you, you didn't, you could just reason this out for this small example because what we're doing here is we're saying take the 20 people, right? So those are the football players, but, but you want only these, only these people who, don't, who only like football. So then you say, okay, let's subtract football and, base, and basketball. So that's these guys. Uh, Five, yeah. Thank you. Five, so thirteen. Okay. So I said, take these twenty players, then subtract these three players, and then subtract these five players. Okay. But then I over subtracted these guys, so I need to add them back in. So I add them back in. So this is how you do this in a Venn diagram, but, but the point is that inclusion, exclusion, or, or Mobius inversion just does it for you systematically. Okay? So that's how you can crack the GRE. I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, th this kind of question, it's always about this. Um, any questions about it? I should tell you that in, in, in the notes, I just wrote one equation, inclusion exclusion formula, and I wrote one equation, and it looks very different from what I'm writing here. So I think a good exercise would be to look at that and, and, and see why it matches what I'm saying here. Okay. But, uh, but that's one application. It's, it's, it's kind of a baby application, okay? But let's, let's do something more interesting. I mean, you didn't, you didn't need to take this class to solve this problem. But let's do another application, which I like. Of uh, so this was example three. Right? Another application, and you might already know this problem. So the problem is like this: you have a party, you have n people who go to the party, and everyone has a hat, and then they get to the party, and 
you should know that it's rude to walk into a house with your hat on, right? So then you, everybody, everybody leaves the hat at the door, and then they go to the party. And then they get really drunk, and then on the way out, everybody just grabs a random hat and gets home. And then the question is, what is the probability that no one got their hat? I don't know if you know this problem, but so you have n people n hats n people each with a hat okay and then uh, they drop the hats and then uh, pick them up one hat at random on the way out. So the question is, what is the probability that no one got their hat? Okay. Is the question clear? Have you seen it? Maybe some of you have. Um, so let's. There's a whole variation of questions you can ask about. What's the probability that one person got the Right. So, so what are we going to do? We're going to define two functions, f, of f and g. So let's say that s is a subset of the people. And we're going to define two functions. f of s is going to be probability that the people in s have the right hat. Okay. And g of s is going to be the probability that exactly the people in S, have the right hat. No one else does. OK? So, what am I trying to compute really? What am I really trying to compute? I'm trying to compute the probability that no one got their hat. In other words, I'm trying to compute the probability that exactly the people in the empty set have the right hat. So what I want is G of the empty set. That no one got the right hat. Okay? But it's not so simple. It's not so simple. But then what we can do is we can say the following thing. We can say, okay, same argument as before. The probability that people in S have the right hat. Okay? If the people in S have the right hat, then the set of people who have the right hat is a superset of S. So we can just add over all the possible supersets of S and G of T, okay? So what am I saying here? I'm saying, I don't know, let's say that the three people at the party, at the party are Dito, Ashley, and myself, okay? What is the probability that Dito got the right hat? Well, it's the probability that exactly Dito got the right hat plus the probability that exactly Dito and Ashley got the right hat plus the probability that Dito and I exactly got the right hat plus the probability that the three of us got the right hat. These events are, are, are mutually exclusive, and so I add their probabilities. Okay? Great. That means that G of S is the sum over the supersets of S of minus 1 to the number of elements of T minus the number of elements of S times F of S. Okay? Okay. 
Now, the thing is that actually f of s is very easy to compute. g of s is difficult to compute, but f of s is easy to compute. What is f of s? The probability that people in s have the right hat. Well, this is the, the number of valid outcomes over the number, total number of outcomes. Right, that's, that's the probability. Now, what's the total number of outcomes? You have n people, you have n hats, right? And let's, maybe let's, let's number the people one up to n, and let's number the hats one up to n. And let's say just that people were so drunk that they couldn't read the label, okay? But that, I think the numbering is gonna help us. So then basically you have to say, what hat did the person number one get? Some number. What hat did person number two get? Some other number, a different one, and so on. And so what you're gonna get is precisely a permutation of the set of hats. So there's exactly n factorial possible out outcomes. Okay. Now what are the favorable ones? Well, the favorable ones are when the people in S all have the right hat. So, that's, so those people have the right hat and there's no room for variation there. What about the other people? Well, the other people just got some random hat. And so what you get to do is to permute the other hats. So that's n minus S factorial. N minus the number of elements of S factorial. Okay. So that's very easy to compute. And then we get summation for T superset of S minus 1 to the number of elements of T minus the number of elements of S. And then F of S is this. Okay. Now, that basically means we have a formula for g of s, and now I can just compute g of the empty set, which is what I want. What is g of the empty set? It's the sum over the supersets of the empty set, which are all, basically all the sets, of minus 1 to the number of sets, elements of t, and Wait, what am I doing here? Sorry. Here I should have written the g of s is this times f of t, right? Because that's what, that's what I need to do. Here I have s in terms of t, and here I should have s in terms of t also. This should have been a t. So that means that this should be a t also. And so this is n minus the number of elements of t factorial over n factorial. Okay. We, can, we can write this a little bit more cleanly by saying, let's sum from k equals 0 to n, and then sum over the subsets of t having exactly k elements, and then I get minus 1 to the number of t, which is k, times n minus k factorial over n factorial, okay? So I just classify the sets according to their size, and now you'll see that this, this right here, doesn't depend on t, right? And so here I'm just, I'm just adding a constant a certain number of times. How many times? Well, the, the number of subsets of size k, which is n choose k. Minus 1 to the k, n minus k factorial over n factorial, okay? And you'll see that actually this is going to provide some cancellation because this is n factorial over k factorial, n minus k factorial, minus 1 to the k, 
n minus k factorial over n factorial. This cancels this. This cancels this. And so what you get is just summation from k equals 0 to n of minus 1 to the k over k factorial. OK? So that's the probability. The sum from k equals 0 to n of minus 1 to the k over k factorial. Now I, I should ask you, does this look familiar? Have you seen this before? What is it, Dito? This is, if, if this was infinity, this would be precisely the, this, this series has up to e. And what you get are the partial sums. I mean, this is 1 minus 1 over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial minus 1 over 3 factorial plus. So if you had the infinite sum, it would be actually 1 over e. And you're just truncating. Um, you're just truncating, OK, at a certain point. But so what that means is that the probability is, these probabilities converge to 1 over e. And they actually converge there very quickly, because this is, this is an exponential series. Okay? And so this is, this is very close to 1 over e. So from this very harmless question about, about drunken people and their hats, you, 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 end up, you end up stumbling into E. And, uh, and I think this is, when people take a probability course, if you're a mathematician, then you're not scared of E. But, so, but, but this, is, this is where a lot of people encounter E for the first time. It's, a, it's in this kind of harmless problem. Um, OK, so, so I think that's, uh, that's where we'll stop for today. So my, my goal today was to show you that this Mobius inversion formula has some really beautiful applications in, in several parts, in several settings. And what I'll show you next time is how it applies to what we're trying to do here, which is uh, hyperplane arrangements and characteristic polynomials and, that, and all that stuff. Okay. So let's stop there and let's, let's let, let Dilo tell us his cool stuff now. I didn't announce it, but Dito's speaking in the seminar now, so you, you all can stay <laughs> again.